Zarbags gets goblins. I'm excited. I love goblins. I love orcs. I love all things with green skin. Uh, not Orion slave girls. Star Trek reference. Anyway, we have some goblins now. It's a nine model warband. It's going to take me ages to paint, even though they're just goblins. I mean, maybe it won't. It will. It probably will. So, um, looks like they're going to be yellow. Here's hoping. Here's hoping for really nice, bright, disgusting yellow. Open up you. Reveal your secrets unto me. Ugh. Ugh. It's kind of a sick coloured yellow. I was expecting more of a flash gitsy yellow. No, we've got a... It's... Well, I... I'm, it's like Avalon Sunset. There you go. If you want a colour. There's some Avalon Sunset. It is actually Avalon Sunset. There you go. Solved. End the video. That's it. We're done here. No. Let's get the sprues out and have a look -see at them. Also, the instructions. So here's some instructions. Um, the goblins go together. It looks like quite interestingly, actually. Your arrow boys seem to be in one piece, so does Yonetta. The squiggies are in two pieces, and the fanatic is also in three pieces. And your herder is in three pieces, and your shaman is in like four pieces. So then, zoom in on this. Because they're quite small. Okay, the bases are super flat, actually. Um, there's not a lot of texture on there whatsoever. So, how did they paint them in the art? What did I do with the box? So the way they painted them is just kind of grey stones. I'm, uh, you know, like, I guess they're caves, right? Inside of a cave. I guess that'll kind of work. I'm tempted to do them as uh, with that cracked earth stuff, the Agrella Earth that Games Workshop makes. Just make them look like they're more kind of a, in a deserty type locale. But anyway, so here's our netter in one piece. It's a pretty good netter model, to be honest. The seam lines are going to be okay. Also on this sprue we have a squig for Tizit's face. The shaman, who's got a cauldron filled with bones. They're human bones, they're not goblin bones. Oh, we've got two squigs on this frame, actually. Both the squigs on this frame and a bit of the fanatic. This is definitely fanatic chain right here. Who appears to be drinking a potion. He's drinking his madcap mushroom juice. Sending him all insane enough to go and kill himself with a ball and chain. And yeah, so the shaman's on here, two squigs, and a bit of the fanatic and the netter. The mold lines look like they're going to be an absolute nightmare, to be honest, on some of these. Um, I think they had to do this in order to fit this many models on the sprues. They're properly crammed in here. Actually, the mold lines on mine are really prominent. You can see them. So, going to be a fair bit of cleanup involved on these for me. You can even see bits of uh, plastic hanging off the the twisty bit in the middle. I don't know if that's got a name. So, here's our arrow boys. I like this guy. He's pretty good. He's grinning. He can't. He can't actually see because his hood is completely covering his eyes. So he's just hoping. This guy has an arrow through his hat and is about to fire a mushroom. No, ah, I see. His arrows, instead of 
I guess, feathers. I can't remember what the name of these things are. Comment below if you know the, the actual names of things on arrows. They are mushrooms instead. Because, you know, mushrooms, they're not going to be aerodynamically sound. And here's the last one who's got a mushroom for a hat. Because, of course, they really go into town with the mushroom thing for the goblins range these days. And we have some more of our fanatic here with the big ball. And there's the rest of it down here. And then, where's the squig herder's head? Because I was curious as to how that was going to work. Um, that's it there. So, it's got the lid, the chin guard. Where's his torso then? Because presumably that's got the rest of it. And this bit is actually a bit for the shaman. That connects up to the base and there's detail on the base, so that's interesting. Or oh, this is for the squig herder. I can't remember which bit's which. Where's the rest of his body on the squig herder? It's not on this frame. So it must be on this frame. Ah, there it is. That's the squig herder with his poking staff. So yeah, the sides of his helmet that open up to reveal his face are there. And his little... And the rest of the brazier is on his back there. So that's his back on this one. Oh, look, there's little bugs on the base of this one. Little cockroaches. Or something. Who knows what they're supposed to be. And more magicals. It's a, a pond. Something big this way comes. Link in Jurassic Park. That's the spruce. There will be a 360 video after going through the cards showing you what they look like assembled and any advice I have on assembling them. So, cards. Again, a card with some lore on it. I swear these there wasn't cards with laws on in Season 1 of Shadespire. In fact, I don't think there was any lore given to you. But I, maybe I just... No, I haven't thrown away any cards, so I don't think... He did that. Comment below if I'm wrong. I'm sure you will. Uh, these are the Gambit's and Upgrades. Those are the People cards. Fighters. And a lot of objectives, actually. More objectives than normal. It seems. Maybe it's just because there's more fighter cards than normal. So... Put them over there. Go through the fighters first. They've given us the squig herder on the top, which means I bet that's the leader. It's like that old trick opening packs of Pokemon cards, where the best, the worst cards always at the back, and you just move it forward so you've got the best card that was last, that's the last one. Okay, so here we have Zarbag, level two wizard. Uh, movement 3, 2 dodge, off the bat, that's pretty good. That's pretty good, straight off the bat. 3 wounds. Has a cursed sickle that's range 1, 3 dice needing swords, doing 2 damage. Uh, they all get inspired by the same condition, which is you have 3 or more glory points. Apart from um, the squigs and the fanatic who all have their own conditions. But the regular gobos just need 3 glory points and then they're off. So you want a lot of... Uh, Score immediately is if you do something that didn't involve rolling any dice in your decks for these guys. So he's got the scurry universal rule, so we're going to go through that. Now it's a reaction. After a friendly fighter other than a squig makes a move action, note that's a move action. You don't have to have activated them to trigger that move action. Anything that lets you do a move action can trigger scurry. If that move began in an adjacent hex, this fighter makes a move action. They cannot do this if they have any move or charge tokens. So the other thing is, Scurry can trigger Scurry. Um, at least the way I'm reading it does. If there's anything in an FAQ that says that you cannot trigger a move action off another move action as a result of a reaction, then comment below. I'll pin it to the top with the correction. But if I'm right, 
this means that you can go, I move this one goblin, and then all of these people who happen to be in a chain can also move. However, you're not going to be able to do that on the first turn because there are no boards with that many starting hexes next to each other. Inspired, his sickle gains cleave, and that's it. And his movement goes up to four. So plus one movement and cleave on the sickle. A cleave sickle, if you will. And that's it. That's all that happens to him. He's just got two dodge base, so... That's probably what you get for having such an easy to achieve inspire condition though. Then you've got Drizgit the Squig Herder. Um, he is fighting with Squig Brand, range 1, 2 dice needing hammers, 2 damage. So again, this is your big hitter that's not a Squig, I guess. Movement 3, uh, 1 shield for defense, 3 wounds. Um, also has Scurry. Also has an action that this fighter and up to two adjacent friendly squigs each make a move action. A fighter cannot take this action or move in this way if they have any move or charge tokens. So if you move Drizgit via Scurry, he cannot then use that action to move himself and his squigs. So this guy doesn't necessarily want to be in the Scurry chain. He wants to be off herding his squigs. Inspired turns his squid brand, gives his squid brand plus one attack dice, and movement four. No change to his defense, and no change to his actions. So again, plus one uh, dice on squid brand, plus one movement. They get faster when they're inspired, much like the Blood Reavers. Now we've got Dibs, who's the one that can't see. He has Scurry and a Grot bro Bow. Bro? A Grot Bow. I'm probably going to say that a lot. Grot Bow, range three, Two dice needing swords, one damage. Uh, movement three, one dodge, two wounds. Inspired, same as four. Apart from his attack doesn't change and he gains a movement and a dodge. Red cap is exactly the same as dips. Is exactly the same as dips. All the other boys are the same. And you got Progdonetta. He has a barbed net, range one, two hammers, one damage. Movement three, one dodge, two wounds, same as all the other basic grots. The barbed net, if this attack action is successful, reduce the dice characteristics of the attack target's attack actions by one to a minimum of one in the next activation. But only in the next activation. If they choose not to attack back, then this was a complete waste. Also, you have to have successfully done it. So you you put a dam we put one damage on your target, and then they aren't hitting you back as far. But if you charged in to do this, then they're just not going to attack you back and wait until the next phase to attack back with that fighter when all of their attacks and they've gotten themselves out of the net. So move this guy with scurry or some other movement ploy into position so that he can barb to net and then do the thing. But, important to note that unless you're causing, triggering scurry via a ploy or a reaction, um, then you might not survive long enough to be able to pull this off. So you're either going to charge him in and Barbnet's going to have no effect because he's charged and therefore not a threat anymore. Um, and the your opponent will just ignore your barbed net and just wait another activation. Or you do this on the, if you say you went first, and you do this on your last activation, not to prevent your opponent having all of their dice when they're about to go and biff up your leader or something. He's situational. He's not great. Drizgit is his old, um, your fighter. Such as he is. And inspired, Barbtonet gets an extra dice, and he gets an extra movement and an extra defense. So he benefits a fair bit from being inspired. Then you've got Snurk Sourtongue, this is your fanatic. He has a ball and chain, which is range one, one dice needing swords, three damage. It hurts when he just smacks you with it. Movement two, because that ball and chain's heavy, one dodge, three wounds. However, he has reaction, 
and no inspire condition. After an, a an activation, this fighter becomes inspired. Now, this means any activation. Your activation, your opponent's activation, it doesn't matter. As long as an activation has happened, you can choose to inspire this guy. He also has scurry, so you can use scurry to move him into a position, and then, you know, so on. Then inspired. Oh boy, this is the longest text I've ever seen on a card. Action. Scatter four from Sauratung's hex and push Sauratung three hexes along the chain. That's actually important, because if you were scattering him all four, you wouldn't have any control over where he actually ends up. By rolling four dice, but then only actually moving him three along the chain, you get to choose where he ends up, which means you can vary it by basically plus or minus uh, by within like one hex behind the end position. If he would be pushed into an occupied hex, before he is pushed, the fighter in that hex suffers one damage, and you push that fighter one hex. This push must take that fighter further away from Sauratung, but it could take him further along the chain, because that's further away from Sauratung, so you can just keep, you know, bashing someone along the chain. Um, if Sauratung would be pushed into a blocked or incomplete hex, or into a hex with a fighter that cannot be pushed further away from Sauratung, do not push him any further and he suffers one damage, as does the fighter that cannot be pushed. This fighter cannot make move, charge, or attack actions and cannot be go on or be on guard. So once he is inspired, that's it, he's scattering around the board. And the only and in order to get the full three damage out of him, he basically needs to be stood next to someone and scatter through them. And then you can just push them along his scatter his chain and keep moving him into them and then they come out at the other end or they, or they die along the way um i'm hoping there's a card that lets you buff this damage somehow but i don't think there is because it's pretty much contained entirely in this text and it's not actually an attack action so that will be interesting to see um he's disruptive for sure absolutely disruptive, but not necessarily a reliable attacker, but definitely disruptive. Now on to the squigs, Gobbleluck. He has huge jaws, range one, two dice needing hammers, two damage. Movement three, one dodge, two wounds. That's the same as the rest of the gobbos, so it's pretty easy to remember the stats on everyone in this ball band. There. Inspired condition is a friendly Drizgit is out of action. So once Drizgit gets chumped, then both your squigs will become inspired. So that kind of gives Drizgit a little bit of extra life because your, your opponent's probably going to want to take these guys out of action before they take Drizgit out of action. But if they do, they inspire Drizgit. So if they take Drizgit out of action, they inspire both of these. But if they take one of these out of action, they inspire Drizgit. Kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. The squig herders and the squigs seem to be what it's all about in this warband, to be honest. Everything else is for grabbing objectives and distractions. Do not place this fighter normally during setup. When you place Drizgit during setup, immediately place this fighter in your territory as close as possible to that, that Drizgit on a hex. Again, suggesting you could have more than one Drizgit in a warband. This might be laying the foundation for being able to build your own warband in the future. I'm not saying it's going to happen, I think they're just, you know, future-proofing it just in case. Um, other than a starting hex, lethal hex, or blocked hex. So it's going to limit the number of places you can place them, since you will have to place all of your goblins on starting hexes, which means you need to have at least two non-blocked, -blo non non-lethal hexes to place your squigs on for Drizgit, so... Analyze all of your board tiles before using this warband to figure out which one's going to work for you, and you're pretty much just going to have to stick with that. Um, this fighter cannot be given attack action upgrades and cannot hold objectives, and each of them are identical. Bonecracker and Gobbleucker. Inspired, they gain an extra dice on their attack and cleave. Oh, and also an extra dodge. They're pretty easy to smush, but again, smush them, you inspire Drizga. It's an interesting warband for certain. Um, I don't think they're going to be killing a lot, but there are too many of them for your opponent to reliably kill, I think. 
So like, there's nine models. Sure, you can chunk most of them in one attack with most of the warbands, but you've only got four attacks in a phase, so there's no way you're taking them all out. So they're going to score something on on objectives. Um, yeah, it's going to be interesting playing this warband. I know a lot of people in the uh, Warhammer Underworld subreddit are very excited about the goblins. So let's look into the card objectives first. Because they're on top. Call that a win. Score this in the third end phase if there are five or more surviving friendly fighters. That includes squigs. So if you've only lost four guys, you can get two glory for it. It's good enough for the goblins. Score this in the third end phase if there are no enemy fighters in your territory. So playing defensively um, with Denial, I think it is, and Dank Haven in your hand on the last phase could score you, what, four glory? Yeah, might work. Score this immediately if an enemy fighter is taken out of action by a spell cast by your warband. Now, he doesn't have any spells on his card by default, so it all depends upon what spells you give him in your gambits. Infestation. Score this in an end phase if you hold every objective. Um, note... You can use cards to remove objectives from play. And it's worth five glory. And it's an end phase, any end phase. So if you pull it off once, you've done. Also, they're actually surprisingly fast. They might make it, but they don't have the ability to just like run into your opponent's backfield the same way that, uh, say, spike claws do. Mad Scurry. Score this in an end phase if at least five of your surviving fighters made a move action in the preceding action phase. Again, you could probably pull that off quite easily on the first turn and net yourself two glory, which gets you most of the way to inspiring your entire warband. Get one kill and mad scurry and you're inspired. Um, malicious kill, score this immediately if your warband takes an enemy fighter with two or more upgrades out of action. So, yeah. Take down the big one. Score this immediately if a friendly Snurk Sour Tongue is inspired and takes an enemy fighter out of action. Rewarded for killing people with your fanatic once he's gone loony. Score this immediately if an enemy fighter is taken out of action while adjacent to three or more friendly fighters. Gang up with Scurry, scrag them. So you want to. You can also, however, um, if Trisket's being supported by a Squix, which he should be. You only need one additional person next to Drizgit, and you can use Drizgit, I think, as the basis for triggering your scurry chain. So if you've got Drizgit, two squigs in front of him, and another goblin behind him, that's moving four models, which gets you mad scurry? No, five models gets you mad scurry, but that's quite easy. You're already moving four models as a result of just moving Drizgit, just activating one Drizgit um, with a charge, for example. Charge Drizgit in. And then you've got, uh, you know, two squigs and the one of the arrow boys, let's say, supporting Drizgit, and then you can score Scragged. Not hard to pull off, to be honest, with just a good setup on the starting turn. You could probably pull this off pretty, pretty easily. But you do have to take the fighter out of action, so you need to target something like a petitioner that's got like two health to be able to do that. Uh, am I in focus? I don't think I am. Maybe I am. Score this in an end phase if two or more friendly fighters made a successful attack actions that targeted the same fighter and that fighter was taken out of action in the preceding action phase. Wait, what? Score this in an end phase if two or more friendly fighters made successful attack actions that targeted the same fighter. Right and that fighter was taken out of action in the preceding action phase. I see. So you've got a gang up, take him out with two fight. That's, that's... I don't like this card. Vicious Killers, one glory. One glory for two attack actions. Eh. Not a big fan. It might have its uses, but I'm pretty sure there's a better card to put in your objectives deck than that. Score this immediately if a friendly fighter successfully casts a spell and there are two or more crits in the casting roll. 
Can't bother that up with power surge, but also we're into the universal objectives now. Goblins can pull this off easier than everyone else, I think. But it requires that you actually you know, put any spells in your deck and use your spellcasting leader. Score this in an end phase if you have fewer glory points than an opponent. That's interesting. But also, I happen, I've already looked at the Echoes of Heroes, is what it's called, um, cards. I happen to know there's another a lot of cards in there that reward just the amount of glory that you have. So this is good. But also, catching up can really help inspire your goblins. If you only have two glory and they have three glory, oh look, now you've got three glory and your whole warband is inspired. Extreme Flank. Score this in an end phase if there is a friendly fighter on an edge hex and another friendly fighter on an edge hex on the opposite side of the battlefield to the first fighter. Doesn't matter where that edge hex is. Where there is more than one opposite edge, it must be the furthest of these edges. So you start people on two opposite ends of your board, which you're going to because you're going to fill your starting hexes with this warband. And then you move one that way and one that way. And you've scored Extreme Flank and gained 2 Glory. Not bad. Interdiction. Score this in an end phase if your warband took an enemy wizard out of action in the preceding action phase. I think this is more useful for Storm Sires Cursebreakers, to be honest. But again, requires that your opponent has a wizard. So... This probably only going to be useful at the moment with these warbands out in only what one third of your games. Yeah, situational. Probably wouldn't take wouldn't take it, considering that there are cards which will just give you glory for taking people out of action at all. And you can only have twelve objectives, so don't see think that that's going to get any play. Score this in an end phase if your warband made at least four different actions from the following list in the preceding action phase. You have to make four different ones. So move other than part of the charge, attack other than part of the charge, charge guard, another action on a fighter card. I think this would work quite well in Eyes of the Nine because you've got an action on your fighter card, you can call in your blue horror and... Uh, then do three other actions but they all have to be different so a move a fight a charge and something else because probably not guard because no one uses guard that much unless they're going to use um, change plan magical void score this in an end phase if an opponent's warband attempted to cast at least one spell and did not successfully cast any spells in the preceding phase so if you shut down their magic for one spell you can gain a glory from it, but only in the end phase. Score this immediately if an enemy fighter is taken out of action by a lethal hex. Meh, yeah. I could see that happening, but I wouldn't build my deck around it. Score this immediately if each hex adjacent to an enemy fighter is either occupied, blocked, or lethal. Again, wouldn't build a deck around it. Score this in an end phase if you gained at least three glory points in this round. Again, lots of cards in this season that seem to be rewarding you for just how much glory you have. The rich get richer, etc. But in some cases, the poor get richer. Eh. I can't make a political point with this. Score this immediately if your warband takes an enemy fighter out of action with a spell. So, again, a card that's probably more useful for the Curse Breakers because they're all spellcasters and they all have spells on their cards. Oh, no, wait, they don't. Only Curse Breakers actually got a spell action, attack action on his card by default. Everyone else is just a spellcaster with a buff. So, yeah, Eyes of the Nine, Curse Breakers, is a card for you. With our bare hands, score this in the third end phase for at least three surviving friendly fighters and no surviving friendly fighter has an upgrade. Meh. It's three glory, but it's um, another card that's like, hey, I played badly, here's some glory. So, let's look at some other cards here. Uh... 
So let's do those. Everything is mixed up. Everything is mixed up. Okay. Gambits. There are many. That was a phone. Gambits. Gambit spell. Two swirlies. If this spell is cast, choose a hex within four hexes of the caster. Any fighter in that hex or any adjacent to it suffers one damage. It's a pretty standard four tile, four hex, uh, four hex range spell. Fungal Blessing. Play this after an enemy fighter's attack action that takes an adjacent friendly fighter out of action. Their attacker suffers one damage. So, yeah, that's a bit of a screw you. On dying. Gambit spell, one swirly. If this spell is cast, choose a fighter that has the highest wounds characteristic on the battlefield. That fighter has minus one wounds to a minimum of one. This spell persists until that fighter is out of action. There was one of these in the eyes of the nine as well that does that. So that seems to be not a, a spell that a lot of people are going to get, but it isn't a universal spell. Probably so the curse breakers don't get it, but I can't remember if they have it or not. Little Warg, plus one dice to the first attack action made by a friendly fighter in the next activation. Uh, buff your squig herder up, basically. Madcap Mushroom, it, it's, an, it's an innate lightning bolt and swirly. So that's pretty good. For the next spell your warband attempts to cast. Um, but obviously you're probably going to play this when you have a spell in mind that you're going to cast. But at least it's not restricted. That's pretty good. The fighter casting the spell suffers one damage if there are any crits in that casting roll rather than two or more. But, doesn't matter how many crits you roll, you'll still only suffer one damage. Madcap Mushroom plus Power Surge equals, hello, I'm going to do all of the things. Make some noise. Choose up to two friendly squigs and push each of them up to two hexes. Pretty good. Horrible Leer. Gambit spell, one swirly. If this spell is cast, push each enemy fighter adjacent to the caster up to one hex. It's a push. It lets you push people. Um, you probably won't be able to trigger Scurry than that unless you keep them in a chain. Because it's you know, a push, not a move action. So it might... Don't break the chain, basically. Sneaky Stabbing. It's a Gambit spell. Spell it needs two lightning bolts. If this spell is cast, plus one dice and cleave to the first attack action with a range of one or two made by a friendly fighter in the next activation, this is a good card for buffing your squig herder. Again, remember, the fanatic is not an attack action. It's just an action. Sneaky stabbing, good on your squig herder. Take this card in your goblin's deck, please. I think this is a good one. Sneaky step, choose a friendly fighter and push them one hex. Plenty of pushes in this card, in this deck, in this uh, set of cards. Stab him in the knee. I like the flavor text on this of more, the most out of any flavor text I've seen so far. If the first attack action in the next activation has a range of one or two, it has plus one damage for each supporting fighter after the first. Okay, so we've got Scrag in. We've got Stab him in the knee in play. We've charged Drizgit in. He's got two supporting squigs and a supporting goblin from Scurry, right? And then he goes smack. He's doing like six damage at that point. Damn, Drizgit can one-shot people when you've got to stab them in the knee in play. This warband rocks. <laughs> Assuming you hit. If you play all of those cards and then your opponent just rolls like double crits for their defense or something, then uh, yeah. You have every right to flip the table at that point, I think. <laughs> Your wombo combo just failed. Endless will. Each adjacent fighter suffers one damage. This action can only use this action only if this fighter is inspired. So, this is good, because this makes your fanatic thing. If you're going to build upon making your fanatic be dangerous, you need this in your deck. Obviously, it can only go on Snurk Sourtongue. This means that instead of scattering and doing a thing, he just does one damage on everyone adjacent to him. Makes him nasty. Extra bouncy. On go this can be played on Gobbleock or Bone Cracker. When this fighter makes a move or charge action, they can move through other fighters, but their move must end in an empty hex. 
Uh, fiery Brand for Drizgit. On a critical hit, this fighter's attack actions with a range of 1 have plus 1 damage. Again, there are so many ways to get extra damage onto Drizgit. He's actually quite nasty. Uh, Grizzled Survivor, again, Drizgit, plus 1 defense. I'm liking Drizgit. Drizgit's looking like he's going to be an you know, absolute royal pain. People are going to want to kill him on turn 1. Do not let them. Reaction. After a fighter has pushed a number of hexes, doesn't matter how many, if that fighter was adjacent to this fighter before the push, push this fighter up to the same number of hexes. This fighter must end the push adjacent to the other fighter. So that's like scurry, but for one guy, um, yes. Hang on. I'm, I'm slightly confused by this card. Reaction. After a fighter is pushed by a number of hexes, if that fighter was adjacent to this fighter before the push, that doesn't make any sense to me. If that fighter, the one that was pushed, was adjacent to this fighter, well, I don't know what this fighter is, then push this fighter. Oh wait, it's an upgrade. Nah, ha, 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 ha. Now it makes sense. Put this on a put this on a put on a goblin. They can lurk about and follow them around. But okay, it makes pushes basically be like a scurry. I get it. I get it now. Makes no, makes sense now. I don't realize it's an upgrade. Thought it was a ploy. Nasty Stabber. It's range one, two hammers, doing two, da two damage. This attack action has plus two dice if a friendly prog is supporting this fighter. Prog? Who's prog? Prog is the netter. So basically, I reckon Drizgit, with his two squigs, and Prog hanging around together, that's your team. That's your team of people that you want to really go around mugging the enemy team, one at a time. Um, but uh, you can give Nasty Stabber to Drizgit. It'd be pretty nasty, actually. Plus two damage if Prog is supporting. Keep moving around in pairs. Because Scurry can be triggered by a charge action because the first part of charge action is a move action. That's good. Put that on Drizgit. Put everything on Drizgit. Drizgit gets all of the things. Another squig upgrade. Plus one damage to this fighter's attack actions with a range of one. Yeah, pretty good. Squig's nasty. Sniffer Spite. If this fighter is in enemy territory in the third end phase, gain one glory point. Mm, yeah. I guess it's kind of like a key, but easy to pull off, maybe? Vindictive Glare, range 3, needs lightning bolts, and is 1 damage. On a critical hit, this attack action has plus 1 damage. Not great, but it gives him an attack action that's a spell, so you know, that's something. Because he doesn't have one on his card. Volleycaller. Reaction, after this fighter makes the Grot Bow attack action, an adjacent friendly fighter makes their Grot Bow attack action. So stick this on one of your Grots, someone next to him can also attack at the same time. Again, there's a lot of things that lets multiple people attack or move at the same time as others. I guess that's how they get around the fact that there are nine models in this warband. Considering that you'll be moving um, Drizgit, Two Squigs and Prog around as one mass... Like, it only takes one move or charge action to move that entire mass around. Also, you can use a charge action on Drizgit to charge up that entire blob up the board, and then you can still attack with Squig, Squig, and Prog. That's pretty good. Like, it doesn't matter what the rest of your warband's doing. You've got four people there that you can use all of your activations on and just go and absolutely murder someone, and there's no way they're killing all four of them before the end of the phase, so... Yeah, I'm liking this warband. Abasoth's unmarking, so we're in the universals now. Gambit, it requires a lightning bolt. If this spell is cast, choose an objective token within four hexes of the caster, remove it from the battlefield. Again, I said there are ways to take objectives off the board. This is one of them. Arcane Shield, you want this. If there's like one reason to get this set of cards, and if you're playing like Curse Breakers, you want Arcane Shield. 
It's a gambit spell. It needs two swirlies. If this spell is cast, reduce all damage suffered by the caster by one to a minimum of one. It persists until the caster is out of action. Note. This is amazing. <laughs> uh, making curse breakers take, like, barely any damage. You want to keep curse breaker alive? Stick an arcane shield on him. That's a really good card. And will make the curse breakers pretty much unkillable. So, yeah. I like that one. That's a good spell. Uh, Encroaching Shadow, choose an enemy fighter in an edge hex, they suffer one damage. Yep, so you know, punish them for using hidden paths. Healing Pulse, it's a spell, it requires one swirly. If this spell is cast, choose a friendly fighter within four hexes of the caster. Remove up to one wound token from that fighter's fighter card at the beginning of each round before the first activation. This spell persists until that fighter is out of action. So it turns one of your fighters into a moving heal bot, basically. Um, it, gives them, it gives them regeneration, basically, which is pretty good, actually. Uh, especially on someone that's like maybe only going to take one damage because they've got arcane shield on them. They take the one damage and then they heal it in the next activation. Um, sorry, not next activation, next round. Not bad. Some good spells in this deck, in these cards. Better than the ones in the Eyes of the Nine, I think. In fact, I think overall, if you just wanted cards so far to buff up a spell-based deck, this is a this is a good set so far. But the objective is for casting spells with Eyes of the Nine, so. Infinite Riches. Gambit spell, two lightning bolts. If this spell is cast, choose one upgrade from your power discard pile and add it to your hand. Um, I can't remember, but when someone dies, do all of their upgrades go in the discard pile? Comment below if you know the answer to that question. Because that changes how good this card is. Levitation. Gambit spell, lightning bolt. If this spell is cast, the caster treats lethal hexes as normal hexes. This spell persists until the caster is out of action or the end of the phase, whichever happens first. Mirror move. Reaction. Play this after an opponent pushes a fighter. Choose a different fighter and push them the same number of hexes. One step head. No, it doesn't matter who your opponent pushes with this. It could be one of your fighters, it could be one of their fighters. It just says when your opponent pushes a fighter. And then you can choose any other fighter, including one of their fighters. That's an interesting card, because you could use it to push someone into a lethal hex, for example, and kill them. You could even use it to push... No, you can use it, you can only use it to push a different fighter, so you can't push them back. One step ahead, you can play this card in the final power step of the round. Choose an opponent and name an objective, then roll an attack dice on a hammer or crit. That opponent cannot score that objective in the subsequent end phase. So some mind games there, I think there's another one in... Uh, the Shades by Season that did a similar thing. But I don't think it required you to roll a dice, I can't remember. So, Pit Trap. Reaction. Play this after an attack action that drives an enemy fighter back. They suffer one damage. Oh look! This is probably going to be another uh, must-have card in any aggro deck. Sphere of Shaish. Gambit Spell requires one Lightning Bolt. If this spell is cast, choose an enemy fighter within three hexes of the caster. Wound tokens cannot be removed from that fighter's card. This spell persists until that fighter is out of action. That's interesting. Again, it suggests there's going to be a lot more ways to remove wound tokens from people's cards in the future. Chained Spite. Scatter. It's an action. Scatter three from this fighter's hex. Choose one fighter standing in a hex in the chain. They suffer one damage. It uh, doesn't really seem worth it for one damage, but maybe. Faneway Crystal. When this fighter makes a move action, they do not move normally. Instead, place them on any objective token, then discard this card. It is still considered to be a move action. So that lets you teleport to any objective token on the board, so long as you know, there's not someone already stood on it. That's pretty nice. And they can keep doing it and just ping between different objectives. This might be good on dwarves. If you score a critical hit when making an attack action with this fighter, that attack action has plus one damage. 
Uh, yeah. It, yeah, it's a it's more damage, um, but only on a crit. So, like, quite honestly, this or just plus one damage. I guess this applies to things that are range three. So that's something. Whereas there's not many plus one damage on range three attacks. Low cunning fighters supported by this fighter have plus one damage on their attack actions with a range one or two. So you can stick that on a squig. You can also stick this on proc. Thus giving Drizget another plus one damage. I told you there's a lot of ways to get Drizget extra damage. Mutating Maul. It's a weapon with one range, two hammers, and two damage. When a fighter makes this attack action, choose cleave or knockback one. This attack action has that rule in this activation. So it's a handy dandy cleave or knockback depending upon what you need. I think that one was spoiled before in the uh, Warhammer community posts. Nullstone Axe. It has two profiles. One of them is range one, two hammers, two damage. You can reroll one dice in the attack roll if the target is a wizard. The other one is, I guess, a throne version. Range three, two hammers, one damage. After a fighter makes this attack action, you discard this upgrade because you threw your axe at someone. You can reroll one dice in the attack roll if the target is a wizard. Parrying blade. Uh, it's range one, two hammers, one damage. Reaction during an attack action that targets this fighter and fails, this fighter cannot be pushed back and you make this attack action. Yeah. It's a bit like um, what Angharad does in Steelcast's Champions. When she's inspired, I believe. Potion of Rage. During this fighter's attack action, before any dice are rolled, discard this card. The attack action has plus two dice until the action is resolved. I'm liking all these new potions we're getting. They're interesting. Spiteful Charm. Reaction. After an enemy fighter's attack action that damages this fighter, discard this card. Choose one of the enemy fighter's upgrades. That card is discarded. Okay, yeah. Also, you don't lose that card, so you can just keep getting rid of their upgrades every time. But it requires that you stay alive long enough to do it more than once. And Tome of Incantations. Here is our Catafrain Tome from this set. That looks like there'll be one in each uh, Warband. Each time this fighter attempts to cast a spell, after the casting roll, you can change one of the symbols rolled to Lightning Bolt. I believe the Curse Breakers would quite enjoy this one as well, as would the Eyes of the Nine, I suspect. These tomes seem like they're pretty much made for spellcasting decks, which suggests that spellcasting decks aren't really going to be at their most powerful until all of this season is out. So we'll see how that goes. So there we go, that's the card. I think Zarbag skits are going to be quite powerful, but quite hard to use effectively. Um, I think they're going to suffer from anything that's got... that's doing damage in an area. So I think the Curse Breakers might actually be a pretty good counter to Zarbag skits, so long as you can get some good spells off on turn one. Um, also, Drizgit is just going to murder you I think it's all about Drizgit. I'm going to be building a deck for these guys based entirely around making Drizgit just be the biggest murder machine he could possibly be. Because it's going to be hilarious. So I'm now going to uh, go off and assemble these models. And for you, there will now be a 360 little spinny video of these models all assembled up, which I will talk over in the voiceover so that you know any advice I have for assembling them. Okay, off we go. Okay, these guys were a nightmare. Absolute, absolute nightmare. They took far, far longer than the Eyes of the Nine to clean up, not just because there's nine models, but because the mold lines on mine were atrociously bad. Um, they were about half a millimeter in height, which meant they were just super prominent everywhere there was a mold line and the mold lines are really really visible on these models they're not hidden well at all so this is kind of another fire slayer situation where the mold lines are just all over the place um, i feel like they had to do this in order to fit this many models onto the sprues but yeah i'm not happy with it there's a lot of gaps as well that will need filling um on the clothes 
there are gaps just right down the middle of the shoulders, just right out in the open that I'm going to have to spend ages filling. And there's nine models and there's gaps on every single one of them. I had to trim the pegs off almost every single model in order to be able to get them to fit flush. Um, I was thankful that four of the models don't require any assembly aside from putting on their base, so you know that saved some time. But they still have some pretty nasty mold lines down them. Um, the Shaman, you cannot paint him off his base because his left arm is attached to his cauldron, which is attached to some toadstools which are attached to the base. That's a pain. Um, the squigs were an absolute mare to put together. Um, even push fitting them because I want I wanted to use glue so that I could actually fill the gaps at least a little bit that were in them. You can kind of see on this where the mold the gaps are. Um, once I trimmed everything down so that it actually fit flush and was uh, pushed up against each other nicely, so that it weren't as, the gaps were as small as I could get them. Um, they wouldn't hold together great, and yeah, you know, I ended up with a big thumbprint in the glue of one of them, which I had to sand down. They also seem like they're gonna be really easy to break when you push them onto their bases. Speaking of easy to break, the Fanatics chain broke on me while I was clipping it off this frame. I'm normally really careful with this stuff, in fact I was being really careful with it, I was holding it in place with one hand and clipping far away from it on the sprue with the other, with my clippers, and it just snapped with almost no pressure whatsoever, it just punk, gone, snapped in the middle. Fortunately, it was really easy to repair, but just be aware of that, the Fanatics chain will probably break on you at some point. Um, yeah, it was actually more um, flimsy than some of the Night Haunts in the uh, Briar Queen set. Aside from that, I'm looking forward to painting them. Um, I just think that there's going to be a lot of fragile bits on these that you could break easily. The toadstools on all of the bases, for example, they seem like they're going to just break with the slightest amount of pressure, so be careful. So there we go, I hope you liked this video, uh, you can subscribe in the top left there, check out my Patreon which helps the channel out if you uh, do a patron. There's another video you can watch and comment below with any comments on this warband, are you excited? I really want to go and paint a squig now, bye.